belong to Glasgow, dear old Glasgow town. But what's the matter with Glasgow for? It's going round and round. I'm only a common old working chap, as anyone can see. But when I get a couple of drinks on a Saturday, Glasgow belongs to me. Most other games, uh, the fans will cheer if something happens on the park, a good move, a good shot. But in old firm games, they're in half an hour before the kick-off, it's full, and the songs start. It's as if they want to get things off their chest, uh, and it's like a fight, it's like the Alamo. And I remember one day I broke, and the ball coming out, well, the ball went out for throwing, I meant to take a throw on. The next thing there was a whiz by my ear. And I was wondering what it was at first, because it was a lovely day, I can always remember it, and I thought it was a, a wasp or something when I went like that. But the thing's landed in front of me in a big hole in the ground, I've picked it up, there's a golf ball with nails in it. Glasgow is home to Britain's most famous sporting dynasties, Rangers and Celtic. Footballing giants, they've dominated the Scottish game for a century and have become a force to be reckoned with throughout Europe. Both with a committed following that knows no equal. Glasgow had the three biggest football grounds in the world, in this city. Hampden Park, Celtic Park and Ibrox were the three biggest places you could go on this planet to watch a game of football. The club's power across Glasgow breeds unquestioning passion for the game, but it also brings with it an unparalleled rivalry throughout the city. For Celtic and Rangers fans, Glasgow holds their greatest love, but also their oldest enemy. It is a rivalry that divides the city, not just on match days, but all year round. There are definitely Celtic areas and there's Rangers areas, there's pubs you'd go into and there's pubs you wouldn't go into, and that's both as supporters and, and as players, you know. There's definitely that divide. And people, that's an acceptance, there's an acceptance there of that. You say, oh, that's a Rangers pub up there. And there's, there's certain pubs you'll go into, there's a Celtic end and there's a Rangers end. Down here, you look at it and you think, oh, it can't be that bad. But up there it is, it's life or death to some of people. Anywhere in Glasgow you go, they'll not be long in finding out exactly who you support and what school you went in, just be maybe your name. It's a unique thing when you find that you're going out on a Saturday night to somewhere you don't really know. And it's a procedure of learning, you know, just to make sure that you're safe and you can get home okay. Unlike in any other football mad city, support for Glasgow's two rivals is not a matter of personal choice or passing fashion, but of deep-rooted religious and tribal loyalty. The Rangers is the club of traditional Scottish Protestantism, while Celtic support is rooted in the Irish Catholic community of the west of Scotland. It is all about bigotry. I mean, if, if you are a, a Roman Catholic, then the only team to follow is Celtic, and of course, if you're a Protestant, it is Rangers. You go to Ibrox, as soon as you walk in the door, it's up to our knees in Fenian blood, it's no surrender, it's no Pope of Rome, it's all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, even if you were the most enlightened person in the world. And he said, I'll give it a chance, I don't want to get involved in this stereotyped sectarianism. I'll go to Ibrox and I'll see what happens. Do you think you'd be made welcome? Go to their matches and all you get is the stuff, these people going on about 17th century Dutch history, a potato famine in Ireland from two centuries ago. I mean, what are they on about? Yeah, I'm not going to apologise because I'm a Scottish Protestant or a loyalist and I identify with the Rangers football team. I'm not going to apologise for that. I'm quite proud of being Scottish and Protestant. So what's the problem? I'm not creating the problem. It is the only derby in the world which is based on a, a genuine division in society. It's not just it's about two football clubs in a city which is passionate about its football. It's about two different communities inside that city supporting their own sides. 
In this game, the Celtics played the Rangers. The Rangers won. What did not go into the records, but should have, was how many injuries there were before, during, and after the game. Scots, as everyone knows, do not talk much. That makes it difficult for a loyal fan of one team to persuade a loyal fan of an opposing team that he is wrong. So, with verbal persuasion denied, they bash each other in the mouth. From earliest days, the Celtic and Rangers clashes were famous throughout the world. Celtic had been formed in 1888 to raise funds for Glasgow's impoverished immigrant Catholic community. In response, the indigenous Scottish Protestant population adopted Rangers as their own. The political problems between the Irish and the British were now perfectly drawn up in Glasgow behind sporting banners, and from the outset the clashes between the two became a holy war, producing a catalogue of violence. As early as 1898, the game was abandoned when 40 policemen were surprised by a 50,000-strong crowd. Seven years later, the police were ready, but the referee wasn't, and after Rangers won 2-0, he was chased off the pitch by Celtic fans carrying iron spikes. It took a player to die on the pitch to defuse some of the tension between the two teams. Here are the teams, Glasgow Rangers and Dark Shirts, playing on their own ground. John Thompson, Scottish international goalkeeper, is among the Celtic team who play in striped shirts. I remember it, but finished up nothing each, and when John Thompson got injured before the half-time, eh, they were all shouting and booing and everything like that. The Rangers supporters, you know. And David Michael John, the, the Rangers captain, came over and told them to be quiet. It was serious. See? Told them to be quiet. And in the second half, then the teams tried away, just played away because he knew it was serious. He never regained consciousness. The fixture continued undaunted and it bred off its reputation. Even the suspension of league football during the Second World War didn't put off a succession of riots when the teams met in friendlies. Your casualty at your Royal Infirmaries and your places in Glasgow at that initial time, it got to the stage where these people hated when the Rangers and Celtic game came round because they knew what it was going to entail. It just wasn't going to be the 90 minutes with regards to who's the better team in the day or who's won the game. It was, it was going to be all out war. Yet by the late 50s, Rangers and Celtic were becoming as famous for their footballing power as their sectarian antics. While both clubs looked no further than the Glasgow tenements for their talent, they were becoming major forces in the new European trophies. The reason why this rivalry is important and does sustain is because a small country has produced two remarkably good big football clubs out of everything which has separated them. Uh, they've managed to become clubs who over the years have done an awful lot better than clubs from a, a city on the northern edge of Europe should do. It was the 1960s that took the old firm rivalry onto another plane and saw Glasgow challenging Milan in Madrid as the European city of football. 